All right, good morning, welcome. <clears throat> Today we are going to cover chapter 17 in the book. Once again, near the end of this book, these start getting a little, boy, I wish we'd had this information sooner, but we can't give everything. So earlier in the book, <clears throat> we talked about an estate in land. And we talked about the freehold estate, which was defined, wrong word, which was interpreted to mean an undefined amount of time. Freehold meant forever. At that moment, we also mentioned this second type of an estate called a leasehold estate, which stood for a defined period of time. Or as you can see in the word, lease. So here we are at chapter 17, getting ready to cover the leasehold estate. Now, let's go back and look at one thing here. Remember the bundle of rights we got. There were five of them. There was disposition, exclusion, this thing called quiet enjoyment, uh, possession, and the last word is control. Those were the bundle of rights and the definition of title. In that freehold estate, we talked about mentioning, or we mentioned that we would transfer all five of these rights in the conveyance of property for an undefined period of time. Now we're going to talk about the second estate in land, which is a defined period of time, and it's called a leasehold estate. In a leasehold estate, we use these same five rights, and then we transfer them from, once again, attorneys can't use real words, they have to make up stuff, the lessor, which we would call a landlord, and the lessee, which we would call the tenant, probably in most normal, ordinary language. So the lessor is going to transfer or convey these rights in some form to the lessee for a defined period of time. So let's go over these for it real quick and see which ones the lessor actually will transfer. Does the lessor transfer the right of disposition to the lessee? The answer is no, they do not transfer that right. The tenant does not have the right to get rid of the property. That is one right that the lessor keeps. Now, I did have a crackhead try and sell one of my houses for sale by owner one day. I rolled up to the house and went in and there was a for sale by owner sign in the yard. And I'm like, dude. And he's like, well, somebody must have put that in my lawn. I'm like, yeah, right, sure. Then I said, you got any offers? No. So the right of disposition is the one right we don't give away from. Do we give them the right of exclusion? Well, sort of. We give them the right of exclusion so that they can keep people off that are unwanted, but we retain some of that right to go on as the landlord. We have the right to go on to our property. Now, typically in a lease, most landlords write something to the effect of with a 24 hour notice or something of that nature. There is always the situation of what is called an emergency. In an emergency, I as the landlord have the right to go on the property without any notice. Typically an emergency is defined as fire, free flowing water, cries for help, things of that nature, all right? Quiet enjoyment, yes. They have the right to be left alone and enjoy the property to its fullest extent. We are transferring that. Are we transferring possession? Most assuredly, that's the one they really want. 
is to be able to live in the house because that's the whole purpose of this conveyance anyway, is to give someone a place to live. So now the question is, do we transfer control to them? Would it not be really cool if I could transfer control or some of it and actually give that person a written document or the instructions of what control I'm transferring to them? That would be really cool if I could give them an instruction booklet, right? Ta-da! Welcome to a lease. That's literally what the lease is. So yes, we are giving them some control and we are defining the control inside of that lease. Typically, you know, it says things like only to be used as residential. Don't do any major repairs or alterations. Don't park in the lawn, which happens to be a big thing, I guess, in Indianapolis because now I had to add a rule that said, don't park in the lawn, all right? So the lease is nothing more than a set of instructions that we are in fact giving to our client or our lessee that explains to them what rights they get for control. Now, because it is a limited time frame. At some point when that time frame, time frame expires, all of the rights that I have conveyed to the lessee will come back to me, including the possession, including the control, all of those. So therefore those rights are called a reversionary interest. And here's that word again, revert. They are reversionary rights that will come back to me when this defined time frame comes to an end, i.e. the end of the lease, all right? So the state recognizes four time frames. There are four time frames that the state recognizes. And just like before, when we had talked about that there are these bigger ones and then subsets of it and all that. <clears throat> this works very much the same way. And I encourage you to think of it like this because it makes it a lot simpler to me. So the first time frame is this thing called an estate for years. An estate for years. All right. Once again, it has a defined beginning. We initially define when this lease starts. And in this lease, it has a defined end. Starts January the 31st, ends December the 31st. The end date is defined within this lease. So it has a defined beginning and a defined end. Neither party needs to do anything for this lease to end because we created the end date when we begin. So it has both a defined end and a defined beginning. Neither party has to act to terminate it because it terminates automatically on the date that we define. The second time frame is this thing called an estate from period to period. All right, once again, this is a subset. It has a defined beginning. We know when the lease starts. However, when that lease comes to the end of its period, it automatically renews itself, then it renews itself, then it renews itself, then it renews itself, and it has no defined end. It literally just keeps renewing itself for that period, at the end of that period, for virtually ever. 
So my question to you is, if it keeps renewing itself, how does it ever terminate? If it keeps renewing itself, how does it ever terminate? If like the tenant terminates it? The tenant will can terminate it. That's how it terminates. Very good. Well, that's the answer to question number two. So you're one ahead of me, Jaman. But that's that's going to be the answer. But the question I'm asking now is how do we get it to terminate? We must give notice. <clears throat> Not only must we give notice. <clears throat> remember, under the statute of frauds. <clears throat> We must give written notice for it to terminate. Question number two is who can give written notice? Jamon, bingo. Either party can give notice. The landlord can tell the tenant under in writing, hey, at the end of this, I am terminating the lease. Or the tenant can say, I bought a house, I wanna terminate this, and they would do it in writing. So here's the trick question. How much time frame do they have to give notice? How much time frame do they have to give notice? A month? 24 hours? Everybody typically says a month or 30 days. And that is true if the period to period is a month. There are more than month to month rents. We have week to week, we have day to day, which if you think about what a hotel room is, we have year to year. So to terminate a period to period lease, you must give one period's notice, all right? So the most common one that you guys are aware of is the month to month lease. That is the time period in that is a month. So most people say, oh, you give a month. Well, that's correct if it's a month to month. But if someone is on a week to week lease, you only need to give them one week's notice because that's the time period we're dealing with. And that time period is defined in the lease called a period to period. And that period just keeps renewing for another week and then another week and then another week. I have several tenants on a week to week lease. If I wanted to terminate it or they wanted to terminate it, they must give me one week's notice because that's the time period in which we defined it. All right, got it? So the first one has a defined beginning and a defined end. The second one has a defined beginning, but virtually no end until one person or the other gives written notice and they must give that notice one period in advance. Now, if a person stays past their time frame, they create what's called a holdover tenant. If they are there past the time frame that they were legally allowed, either because the lease terminated or they gave termination and said, hey, I'm going to be out at the beginning of April, and all of a sudden April the 2nd rolls around and they're not out they have created what's called a holdover tenant. They are over their time frame. all right? So now the third lease is called an estate at will. What, is an, what does the word at will mean? At will, if you remember from your old Civil War days, when people would say fire at will, that means whenever, whenever. There is no defined beginning and no defined end. That lease can start tomorrow and theoretically end a week from Thursday. 
there has to be no notice by either party. The tenant could just walk up and drop the keys and say, hey, I just moved out. All right, dude, thanks. It's at will. Now, during this at will period, they still follow the rent rules and they still follow the payment requirements. They still follow all of the lease that's in there. It's just that there has to be no notice given by either party. It has no defined beginning and no defined end. So if you can see the pattern here, defined beginning, go ahead, was there a question? I was gonna say that can't be very common, can it? Or is it's that very common? It is not, it is not a very common lease, all right? Typically, this is like, hey, I just need some help. Help my buddy out. Okay, you can move into my rental tomorrow. And the buddy come back and go, hey, I, you know, I've reconciled with my wife. I want to move out. Here's your keys. All right, cool. It's not a very common lease. It's not smart because it doesn't allow for anybody to, you know, plan. Somebody could walk up and go, hey, Mr. Tenant, you're out. Go. All right. It is recognizable. It is a valid lease. It's just not a really good one. Christina? How does that work? Are you in How thought? does it not have a beginning? I mean, wouldn't it begin with a sign lease? It has Even no if you're not actually defined moving on? beginning. It has a no defined beginning. We could start tomorrow. I could start right now. Typically, the other two leases start at the first of the month and you would sign it saying, hey, I'm going to move in next week or I move in at the first of March or something like that where it has a defined beginning. This typically just says starting today, even though it may be the 16th of the month, it starts today. Yeah, inherently, everything has a beginning because they start living there but it has no defined beginning, so to speak. It's not a planned event where they go and move in on the first and they've got two or three days to get ready. It just starts today. Now, the last one is really, in my opinion, not really a lease. It is called an estate at sufferance an estate at sufferance. This is where the landlord is suffering, typically because of the holdover tenant that is still there. All right, they were supposed to be out at the end of March. The 1st of April, I was going to release the property, but the tenant didn't move out. So now there is a holdover tenant in my unit who is not paying rent, so I'm suffering that. It is an estate at sufferance for me, and that holdover tenant is causing a problem. Now, during this estate at sufferance, and there are many, many laws, and each state kind of deals with it differently because it's common law. In Indiana, if you take rent from that holdover tenant, you have in fact created an estate at will. And Christina, here's where this <clears throat> could play out. If they were supposed to move out and they didn't, and it's like the 3rd of April and you go to them and go, dude, you were supposed to move out. And they're like, hey man, the house wasn't ready. Can we stay the rest of the month? Here's some rent. And I accept that rent. I have now created an estate at will because they start today and they're no longer a holdover tenant and I no longer can evict them because they are there under an estate at will. All right. So that's typically when you would see an estate at will is to solve that holdover tenant. If you are a tenant and you were supposed to be out and you call your landlord and say, hey, here's a couple more dollars, can I stay? If they truly wanted to evict you, they would have to say, no, I cannot take the money from you. Because if I take your money, 
that in essence defaults to putting you in as an estate at will, which means you have now that lease has been extended. I really want you out, so I can't take your rent. I got to go to court and evict you. All right. 